You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we're going from on sale to shooting scale in Fab Facts. We're being summoned on false pretenses in the randomizer. <laughs> New guest alert, it's comic artist Nick Abadzis. I thought you were feeling ill there. That's all coming up in Pod 179. Of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. <laughs> Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Richard, pl- please. Well, no, no, I like that. I've just discovered a new noise. I like it's taking you 179 pods to come up with a new klaxon sound. <laughs> as lovely as it is, I think it's quite yeah. off-putting, and it does sound a little oh. bit like when my cat's trying to uh, sort of sick up a hairball. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, fair uh, enough. Now, I am the owner of said cat, Jamie Anderson, yes. and uh, mm-hmm. you with your new klaxon are... I'm Richard James, and uh, him over there... Uh, oh. Ah. Uh, well, what on earth is he doing now? He's rifling through the spoils of our amazing weekend at MCM Comic Con. Now, is. unfortunately, Chris has been too busy to attend said event because he's doing some rather ah. special things, which we might be mentioning later on in the news. Uh, but for now, okay. yes, he's he's going through seeing what's left over, and he's found oh yes, a booster he's eagle there missing a nice leg. Nice little lanyard he's got there as well. Oh yeah, yeah. souvenir lanyard. Several it's lanyards signed by somebody. Uh, yeah. And mm-hmm. one of our amazing foldable card international rescue hats oh which, yes if you were at mcm comic-con you may have picked one up uh, do send us a picture if you did if not would you like a card um fold your own international rescue hat <laughs> i think you probably I mean, might well we're, we're looking oh. at finding ways to make them available to you because they are rather fun uh, Ooh, i spend most of idea. my weekend wearing one <laughs> anyway, Richard, this isn't about yes. uh, events in the past. Well, it is, no. but not Comic Con events in yeah, the recent past. Yeah. This is about other events in the past and the present of the future. I'm going to yes. stop talking. Tell us what's in yes. this Jerry Anderson podcast. Oh, thank goodness for that. Well, yes, as uh, <laughs> Jamie's already intimated, we'll be hearing from Chris Dale a little later on with his amazing randomizer, whereby he sits down in front of a random Jerry Anderson episode and gives us his thoughts, comments, and a review. Will you agree? Will you disagree? Hmm. Who knows? We'll find out later. Also, it doesn't matter if you do, because uh, it's pre-recorded, so you can't actually interact. Sorry. That's right. Uh, We've got some uh, newsy news news news, of course, because there's always brand new stuff happening in the Jerry Anderson universe. We've got Fab Facts coming up in just a little while. Uh, That's where uh, Jamie flicks through a book of Fab Facts. Uh, I shout Fab, and uh, we land upon a little Bon Mo, which hopefully will be of interest to somebody out there. Um, (laughs) Yeah. We've got the first part of your interview with Nick Abadzis, yeah, comic artist. Yeah, lovely Jamie. Nick. What an enthusiast yeah. and what a nice man. We had a great ah. chat there. And he's been involved in the development of the Eagle Moss Eagles, which many oh. of you may have on your Ander shelves. So, yes, great. Um, yeah, if you look at those, yeah. then thank Nick. And uh, to top it all off, Last but by no means least, we'll be hearing from our lovely podstrons oh, who've been emailing us. Yes, at podcast at jerryanderson.com. Uh, they've also been uh, posting on Twitter and hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast, tagging me, Richard N. James, uh, him over there. I'm Jamie Anderson, and him over there. Oh, look, he's almost disappeared into that huge box. I wonder what he's got in there. Uh, that's at Chris Dalek, and posting on our YouTube channel as well, which I see has got over 50,000 subscribers oh we've hit it have we i knew we were close but yep. i wasn't sure we'd actually yep. be there ah oh, well that's lovely there you go. thanks yeah. thanks subscribers and if you haven't yet subscribed then don't worry uh, we do forgive you but only temporarily yeah. it's just a short reprieve yes. so please go and um go and go and subscribe it's youtube.com yeah. slash jerry anderson tv where Easy. richard james mm-hmm. every week mm-hmm. we upload the youtube version of a fab fact that's true but if you want to hear it first each week then you should listen to the podcast which you're obviously doing now since you're hearing these words which means you're going to be the first in the world to hear this week's fab fact i mean that's almost exciting now time for this week's fab facts yes if you're a newbie here a newbie no a newbie i (laughs) or an old wasp uh (laughs) then uh this is fab facts uh where i've got a book of fab facts which is here 
when I flick through it, not there it now, that, oh. uh, but later oh. in a minute, Richard will oh. shout fab yes. at a random point. I'll stop flicking and there we'll find a fab fact, which I will share with you. Hopefully you'll enjoy it and find it fab. Uh, so rather than Bond Mo, it'll be a fab Mo, hopefully. But let's see. Okay. Uh, Richard yeah. James, are you ready with your fab? Yeah, go on then. I'm flicking, flicking back to front today. Here we go. Fab. <laughs> I think it made no difference at all, actually. No, because there we are. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. Okay. This is quite an interactive one, sort of, to some degree. How many right. podstrons out there have used their toys to create a Thunderbird's rescue or an eagle crash? Oh. I mean, I know I certainly have. Uh, I remember as a youngster throwing uh, matchbox Thunderbird 2s around the place to sort of see if they'd embed in the mud in some sort of dramatic angle. So Really? Yeah. And obviously wow. you dropped your eagle in some sick. Yeah, obviously. Sort of. Uh, well, anyway, I probably think it's nearly all. Probably, anyway. But special effects crews are also notorious for playing with toys. The most obvious example is the plastic model kits of tanks, airplanes, and assorted cool stuff that model makers cannibalize for parts. Notably, the Airfix mm-hmm. Bridge Girder set in 176 oh. scale, which right. turns up in countless shots, countless times, detailing on Thunderbirds, as you may have heard mentioned by uh, Justin and Lindsay a few pods ago. Um, mm-hmm. Justin is obsessed with Girder Bridge. I mean, who isn't? However... In addition to plastic kits, some fully constructed toys were broken down to component parts and used as the basis for model vehicles. The Ah. Tiger Joe tank toy came with a very reliable set of wheels that would turn up over and over and over again in models such as Crab Logger in Path of Destruction, Mm -hmm. the Unitron Tank in Point 783, Mm -hmm. and the Shadow Mobiles. Ah. Now these vintage toys can still sometimes be found on eBay which I'm hoping now everyone's going to rush off to eBay and grab themselves a Tiger Joe tank. Uh, (laughs) In one series, a toy produced for the series actually became a featured model in the series itself. (laughs) Okay, right. Any guesses, Richard James? A toy... Say that again. A toy... A toy that was produced for the series... For the series. ...actually became featured in the series. No? No, go on. Okay, well, it's the Hawkwing from Terror Hawks. Oh, is he? Yes, you should have known that. Obviously. Anyway, look, Steve Begg, uh, brilliant Steve Begg, modified a Bandai toy with lights uh, and a detailed paint job in order to substitute for the full scale filming miniature in an episode or two of Terror Hawks. Uh-huh. Reportedly, Ten Top Pop uh, was the, uh, the, the feature one. Okay. The toy sold at auction last year, the actual screen used one. For uh-huh. just seven hundred and fifty British pounds. Oh, there you go. Uh, another toy pops up in the episode Space Giant. When the gigantic Spirilla, who is actually Ben Tuchinsky in uh, a Spirilla suit, uh, pokes <laughs> its head in the cockpit of the Groundhawk, an action figure can be seen staring back at the beast. Interestingly, the colour of the figure looks more like Tiger Einstein than Mary Faulkner. Possibly because the team used the tiger figure from Bandai as a stand-in uh, and obscured the joints with plasticine. So, <laughs> right. if, if you're looking for a miniature for your next film epic, why not try your local toy shop? Uh, you never yes. know what you might find. But can you think of any other examples? I think people are going to certainly say toy, I think, funnily enough, Thunderbird vehicles, Thunderbird, Ford Thunderbirds mm. from the 1960s turned up in quite a few episodes of Thunderbirds, I believe. I'm happy to be corrected on that. But right. Podstrons, can you think of any other examples? Do email us podcast at jerryanderson.com. I, I mean, I suppose quite a bit of modification might have been needed because sometimes the toys aren't exactly screen accurate, are they? <laughs> no, they, they are not, which I guess I'm is why... Thinking, Steve, yeah. go on, go on. What you yes, going? well, I'm thinking of the, the Space Precinct Police Cruiser. Specifically. Ah, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, there's a lot wrong with that, let me tell you. Yeah, as beautiful a, a toy as it is. It yeah. is a great toy, but you could use it in another show or in an, another another feature and dress it up or dress it down or repaint yeah. it. And it doesn't have to be yeah. accurate to anything within that show because no. it makes a, uh-huh. an appearance elsewhere. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. David Tremont did this a really lovely tour of his workshop for Anderson Insiders a little while ago where he oh. shows all the old model kits that he's tracked down which were used for parts or in their entirety sometimes. Um, in the Anderson show so if you're an Anderson insider you can go back and watch that um, Great. rather interesting stuff but yes if you've got any other mm. examples do email us podcast at jerryanderson.com Richard James do you have any other mm. uh, thoughts on toys 
No, uh, only I wonder if there's going to be a, uh, maybe my uh, officer Orin toy could be made uh, of use somewhere else in another show. If someone's doing a stop motion thing of the elephant yeah. man, perhaps oh, uh, might be interesting. Rude. <laughs> Well, it's very rude. It's not of you, is it? Anyway, I know. Uh, before I offend Richard any further, I think that brings us uh, rather mm, hurriedly to the end of this week's rude Toys Fact. Fact. Uh, toys, Richard, come on. No, it wasn't it was rude. rude. You were rude. You're, You're rude. rude. Okay, fine. So that's what good. All right. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, now, uh, you're listening to the Jerry Addison Podcast, of course. Uh, you'll be our friend forever if you subscribe to us or like us or follow us or whichever platform you're listening to us on. And even more so if you were to leave us a nice review or rating mm-hmm. to let us know mm-hmm. what you think. Please do. And even better, because we want the world to know about the Jerry Anderson Podcast, why not copy the link and post it in all your social medias, Facebook and your Twitter and so on? Yes. Let people know what you're listening to, and they might join in. Do you think anyone's got a tattoo relating to the Jerry Anderson podcast yet? <laughs> I mean, I mean, that, Chris Dale, surely. Uh, almost in cert- yeah, certainly, yes, yes. yes. We, yes. we, we can't just... mention where it is, it's too interesting. No, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, now, people have been emailing in, of course, at podcast at uh, jerryanderson.com. Now, here's a rather lovely one with a bit of an update to follow. This is from Ian Stevens, who says, Hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris. I'm writing this email in the hope that Richard might read it out on an upcoming podcast as it's a personal thank you to the members of the Facebook group. Ah, well, wish granted. Yes. On the 29th of October, says uh, Ian, I posted a personal message cursing my own luck because I was looking forward to pre-ordering the UFO comic anthology, but I was made redundant on the same day, oh. so I had to shelve the plan. As I write this... I was absolutely stunned by the response from the Podstrons, including Richard, who sent best wishes. Thanks, Richard. But also to members like Miles Parrish, who, among many others, posted messages of support and best wishes. Jamie, I genuinely think your dad would be so proud of your Facebook group, the fans that follow his shows and the work you do. Richard, Chris, AC and Louise too. The group is so friendly and supportive. Not a bad word is said, and it's a testament to Jerry and you as well. I can honestly say it's an absolute privilege to be a Podstron. Thank you for creating this group and thank you for keeping your dad's legacy alive Aww. right now uh, says Ian I need the Jerry Anderson universe more than ever it's my escape from the real world and takes my mind off the struggles to come I just wish there was an award for the best podcast and Facebook group because without a doubt this is it thanks and sorry for the slightly long winded email but I really just wanted to say a massive thank you to everyone for their support very best regards and that's from Ian Stevens No. So Thanks, Ian. That's lovely. What nice words. Thank you. Isn't it? Fast forward a few days, and uh, there's a post on the very same Facebook group from Ian. I have some newsy news 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 to share, says Ian. I've been offered a job starting on the 15th of November. It's with an aviation company that I originally worked for at the beginning of 2020, but due to the COVID outbreak, I was made redundant. Story of my life. I won't go into the whole detail of what happened, but I apparently made such an impression that they want me back, so I've accepted the offer. I just wanted to share Ah. the news with you because my fellow Podstrons really were a source of strength. This is the best group on social media. Thank you for all your support. It really helped during a difficult time for me. So there we are. Well done, Amazing. Ian. Yeah, congratulations uh, on your new job, and I hope it goes well. Yeah, and, uh, good luck. Yeah, Ian. they're a lovely bunch, aren't they, the Podstron? They are. Oh, yeah. It's always yeah. friendly there. Ni- nicest place on the internet, thanks to that lot. That's what they say. Uh, <coughs> now, Dodge Morgan got in touch to say, Hi, dudes. Uh, he says, I'm a virgin podster. I've been listening to the pods uh, after only recently discovering them. Uh, I've been binge listening to them on YouTube. I'm on Pod 35. By the way, why isn't Pod 32 on YouTube? I've got no idea. (laughs) I wonder what happened there. Anyway, I've been missing out on the up-to-date news by doing this. I've also started listening to the latest pods and as a result have pre-ordered the UFO comic strips compilation. Keep up the good work, chaps. It's almost flawless now. All the best, Dodge Morgan. Oh, thank you very much. Almost, yeah. Uh, Yes, Paul Hyder got in touch from China to say, Hi, JRC which is another way of looking at us, I suppose. How about ending attack on cloud base with the equation E equals MC squared, meaning <laughs> excitement equals Mysterons times cloud base oh, squared. Oh, I see what you did there. Yes. Uh, love the part. <laughs> all the best from Paul. Uh, now, here's one from Simon Morris, a little bit uh, specialist. He says, um, hello, I sincerely hope all's well. Look here. Uh, I'm looking into something about another non-Anderson TV show at the National Archives of Australia that amongst a myriad of other items holds censorship cuts. Hopefully the actual film clippings snipped out at the time or just censorship details presumably made to many, many films and TV shows. And so far, 
I found listings showing that 13 Jerry Anderson productions were cut, presumably for their original showings. Uh, that's in Australia. Uh, for example, uh, Crossroads to Crime, uh, plus episodes of Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet, Joe 90, UFO in Space 1999. What I'd like to ask, says Simon, would you like me to inquire about these bits and pieces of cut material for the podcast? And uh, if I can get digitised copies for you to watch at your leisure, I can but ask, he says. Many thanks for your time. Take care, Simon Morris. That sounds very much like one for Chris Dale to me. Yeah, Don't okay. you think? I we'll reckon. For that on, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thank you very much. So that's interesting. So I suppose we are aware that uh, many shows were were cut prior to broadcast, but I wasn't quite aware how that might change from territory to territory. In other words, what might be acceptable in the US or the UK perhaps wouldn't be acceptable in, in Australia. Or maybe it's timing reasons, I don't know. Yeah, it could be timing. It could be that they get the, the print, which runs to whatever length of time, 25 minutes, yeah. but they've only got 22 and a half, and they need to find ways to cut it, and it's their yeah. job to do it, I guess. Um, yeah. Probably wouldn't be that now, but um, sure. yeah. Interesting. Thanks for that, Simon, and good luck with your uh, your film archaeology. Uh, that sounds fascinating. Well, certainly pass it on to Chris. Yeah. Uh, all for now, uh, all for now, rather, but uh, do get in touch if you uh, would like me to read out your email next time. Uh, it's podcast at jerryanson.com. Com. Easy. Yeah, well remembered. We're really into the flow of the dot com now, aren't we? We've, we've really Just nailed about. that, I think. Just yeah, about, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think uh, so. Richard James, I've got some news for you. I've got news every oh, week. Great. But here's this week's Brilliant. Jerry Henderson News. Yes, it's the Jerry Anderson news. News, 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 news. News. <laughs> gets, gets slightly weirder <laughs> and also slightly more synchronised yeah. every week, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, uh, true. Richard James. Yes. Now, uh, we didn't mention this last week, but since last week's podcast, you hmm. may have seen a trailer for something called Jerry Anderson Presents. You've never seen these. <gasps> yes, not, what's that about? I'm not sure you have to pronounce it with that odd intonation. And you may also <laughs> have seen a clip from that <gasps> You've Never Seen These stream, which is You've mm -hmm. Never Seen This. Now, there's more to come. And let me tell you, <laughs> the best is yet to come. And okay. I think you're going to be rather shocked uh, by, oh, really? by the upcoming news this week. Uh, but yes, You've Never Seen These is a, a live stream for the 25th of November, starting at 6.30pm for a 7pm start UK time. Mm -hmm. It's available for free, courtesy mm -hmm. of our dear friends at Network Distributing. And it's a special evening presented by Dr. Beaker and Professor Mathematic, brought together across right. 100 years of time to showcase <laughs> some very special stuff from the world of Jerry Anson. Now... I can guarantee that you will never have seen these things. Hence the name, oh. you've never seen these. Okay. Uh, it's a one-off. It's never to be repeated. It is going to run live. It will not be accessible after the fact. So right. I implore you, wherever you are in the world, go to watch.networkonair.com and register for an account now. Do it ASAP. Yeah. The product uh, page for You've Never Seen These might be available now, but that's where you go on the night to watch it. But you have to be registered and active on the platform or you cannot see it. It's the only place to see it. And it's a 6.30 for 7pm start UK time. I know that's a bit vague, but I can tell you that there will be things to entertain you in the run-up between 6.30 and 7. And then the whole okay. idea is worldwide, we all get together and we watch this brilliant evening all together, talking on social media alongside it, and just enjoy nice. some very, very special content. I wish I could say more. We'll be able to say more yeah. next week because it is okay. very, very exciting. But yes, you've never seen these. It's going to be pretty special. Lovely. Are you excited? I'm very excited. Yeah, me yeah. too. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On, in, a, in a different area of the Andiverse, um, yes. Space 1999. You remember the rather popular cosplay uh, long sleeve uniforms oh, where we had a Koenig yes. and Carter variant. Well, yep. by popular demand, last Friday we launched the red and purple variants. Oh, lovely. Oh, and they are lovely, yes. Mm. Uh, again, colour matched for, for screen accuracy. They're pretty gorgeous. Uh, available to pre-order. And I'm very pleased to say 
that the pre-order wait will not be long. Oh. They will be dispatched within two weeks from today. Okay, so great. So it's all coming well up pretty quick. And yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. add to your collection. Or if you thought, I don't want to be Coda or Carter, right? I want to be Paul Morrow. Uh, well, yeah. now you can be. Yeah. Uh, so have a look at shop.jerryanderson.com and enjoy those. Uh, if you enjoyed our Scott Tracy in Distress John Reynolds screen print, there are more prints coming this week. So stand by for those. Uh, I think Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds are joining the ranks. Uh, so stay tuned they'll be on our email list first of all so if you haven't subscribed just go to jerryanson.com and sign up to the email list Uh, if not then uh, you'll see it eventually on social media but uh, do be aware they do sell out rather quickly because they are limited to just 50 units hand numbered hand signed uh, by the artist lovely stuff Captain Black Friday I should say Captain Black Friday is coming Uh, there'll be some rather rather deep discounts we've got a lot of stuff we want to clear so we can make ways for some very very cool stuff next year so stand by for that as well details mm-hmm. to follow uh, Peril in Peru is out later this month great and there should be a trailer coming out very soon as well so you can hear a bit more of that it's, uh, it's sounding absolutely marvellous and we are doing our very best to make sure that the digital and physical versions and the book are all made available on the same day so no ah. waits like we had for Operation Ice Cap yeah, for Stingray yeah. we're doing our best to synchronise that now which, ha- which has been quite challenging again with world lo- worldwide logistics paper shortages plastic so- shortages all sorts of logistics issues goodness me it's really tricky but we're getting there so Peril in Peru end of this month digital book and CD uh, and finally on Wednesday this week in your inbox yes. if you're a subscriber to the newsletter and other things you will receive a survey now Oh. Richard, you know we did the, or we've, uh, we're launching in December, uh, the hard copy version of the Space 1999 Moonbase Alpha Technical Manual. Yes. Well, it's been incredibly popular, ridiculously so, in fact. Uh, so much so, we've had so many requests for technical manuals for other series. Oh. We will be showcasing some potential pages from future editions and asking you which one you would like to see first in a survey this Wednesday. Great. Server will be open for five days until the end of Sunday, and uh, we want to know which one you prefer. I'm not going to tell you the options yet, but I think you'll be pleased by the options available. Mm. Um, Stand by, do vote, and basically, whatever you say, and the fans, goes. Uh, The most popular one will be produced first. End of story. So, yeah. Uh, our right. future, and particularly on your head beard, exactly, particularly Chris Thompson's future, uh, because he will be <laughs> yes. leading that project because he did such an amazing <laughs> job on the last one. Uh, his future's in your hands, so yeah. vote wisely. Goodness me, that's a lot of stuff. There's loads more other stuff I can't tell you about, which is very cool. Uh, more to follow on that, uh, including stuff about the concert. I know some people were waiting for us to, to uh, give a casting announcement. That's been delayed mm. very slightly, but it will be, ready, be mm. coming early December at the latest, we hope. But do mm-hmm. stand by for further action about Stand By for Action, the Jerry Anson concert, mm-hmm. and other stuff. Oh, but for now, I need a breather. That's the end of this week's Jerry Anson News. Oh, that was the news. Exhausting news. It really was. Yes. So much news. I mean, it's strange that was there Jerry Anderson news before the Jerry Anderson podcast? Well, there was news, but it wasn't packaged in such a, a beautiful <laughs> way with intro and outro music and, <gasps> yeah, and, and that's stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, true. There you go. Yeah. But there's a whole bundle of news. Now, over on our Facebook group, uh, of course, you don't have to be on Facebook, but if you are, the one place you should head really is the Podstrons Facebook group. It's quite easy. Just search for uh, Official Jerry Anderson Podcast Listeners Group or something like that. Uh, there'll be a couple of questions and you can join in the fun. Now, for example, our moderator, Louise, uh, asked a question What's the first Jerry Anderson item you ever bought or was bought for you? Now, this dates some people, doesn't it? But anyway, Roger Smith says, uh, a fab ice lolly. Steve Andy Rogers, a 1960s Thunderbirds 1 and 2 toys for Christmas. But Lou Dean says the first thing she was bought or bought for herself was the uh, 2004 Thunderbirds trading cards. Well, Anne Andre Willie says Dinky Thunderbird 2 back in the late 60s or early 70s, I think, with the SPV from Captain Scarlet, which is probably next. Uh, Miles Parrish said, I spotted a Matchbox Fab 1 in the bottom of a dollar bag of toys at a market, and my dad bought it for me. I think I still mm-hmm. have it somewhere. So there's a question. Do get in touch. Podcast at jerryanderson. Uh, yes, that's right. Dot com. You see, you're, you're right. Up there. Sorry, yeah, my then, fault. Uh, yeah. And uh, let us know. What was the first thing you bought? Jerry Anderson related or had bought for you Christmas present birthday present or did you spend your pocket money on that something special and do you still have it yes. uh, talking of uh, 
Steve Rogers. His uh, polls continue. His latest one, this will interest you, Jamie, uh, was on International Rescue's hats. Oh, how funny. What do you think of them? And the results were as follows. Uh, 51% of voters love them but think they're, and think they're cool. Uh, 46% like them but wouldn't miss them. Ooh. <laughs> 2% dislike them and think they're a bit air stewardy. <laughs> That's very specific feedback. <laughs> it is rather, isn't it? He says, please note the missing 1% is lost in fractions of a percentage after the figures are rounded to the nearest whole percent. Ah, makes sense. Oh, that's a, that's a, yes, I was worried about those naughty 1%. Know, that up. Yeah. Uh, CJ List says, uh, has a fellow Podstron been sending requests to Radio 2 again? Coming back from a shopping trip, Craig Charles played the Joe 90 theme on his house party show, scoring some serious points there from this little community. However, Mr. Charles loses a whole heap of points for not only talking over the midsection of the theme, arguably the best part, but then cutting off the end to go to a news break, which was then subjected to a technical glitch, either caused by Mistron interference or the inner powers of the Podstrons taking revenge. We Podstrons have powers you cannot hope to understand, Radio <laughs> Two. Uh, <laughs> Gary Hodgkinson says, in response to Chris Dale's request of people seeing The Day After Tomorrow in the 70s, when it originally came out, well, I must have been 13 or so when I first saw it, and I was more interested in it as a Jerry Anderson production and Nick Tate was in it, uh, more than any educational information it may contain, though even then I was surprised that it didn't carry on. I didn't get to see it again, says Gary, until I bought the Lost Worlds of Anderson DVD of a bloke named Jamie at the National Space Centre. Never heard of him. No, I wonder who that could be. Sounds a bit doddy was to there, me. Jamie, was there ever ever the possibility of it being extended into a series? Well, that or? was the hope, yeah. Yes, I mean, the whole yes. setup is off we are into a new universe, yeah. what wonders might be ahead. Uh, yep. None, because we'll never know. Um, which is why Gregory L. Norris uh, wrote his second Indeed. book for Planet 4, which you can get surprisingly from the Jerry Anderson store and elsewhere as well. So, yes, the story does continue, but uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how well it would have worked sure. long term. It's tough to say, isn't it? Yeah, it really is, yeah. Uh, Dean Harrison posted, Things I've never understood about the Andiverse, part one. The commonly heard Mr. On phrase, you know what to do. If they know what to do, why did they need to say anything? You know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I, that's funny, isn't it? It's kind of there more... It's, it's more like, you know, uh, for the audience's benefit, isn't it, really? Yes. Yes, it's dramatic effect, surely. Yeah, and if you start yeah. to analyse the Mr. On's behaviour too much, then it does start to sort of mm, fall yeah. down around one's ears. So, it does, yeah. rather. Paul Hyde finally says, that, Right, now, Richard James and Jamie Anderson, after just listening to Pod 178, I was patiently waiting for news of the special guests to be announced for standby for action, the oh, concert, yes. as promised in the previous pod, yes. but to my disappointment, there was no announcement made. Yes. You two are a big tease, or did you just forget? Didn't forget. No, no, the intention was to announce, but um, yes. Yes, sometimes to do the paperwork and the agreements for these things takes a lot longer than you expect um yeah so that's all uh, and, and also there's still a while to go oh I mean, gosh yeah yeah i mean we're still yeah. uh how far away are we to de december january february march april five months away oh thank goodness i mean that gives me time to polish up the space 1999 theme on my penny whistle doesn't it Which oh I mean, it's be a standout that moment that we're all looking forward to season two obviously oh Obviously, couldn't, that's right. Couldn't do season uh, one justice on a penny whistle. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so do head on over to our Facebook group and join in the fun. Uh, they have streamings and uh, quiz nights and uh, you can post pictures of your favourite merch and your cosplay, all that sort of stuff. Lovely bunch of people. Why not join in the fun? There indeed, absolutely. Or your least favourite merch if you want to take a, a yes, picture of that. That's not? fine too. Yeah, yeah. Now, Richard James. Yeah? Should we give ourselves a little break and uh, hear from this week's interviewee? Oh, sure. Yeah, let's do that. Mm, well, Nick Abadzis, well, mm -hmm. gosh, what a clever man. Uh, are you aware of his rather lovely graphic novel, Laika, about the doggy that went into space? I'm not, no. Oh, it sounds beautiful. Nice. He did it a long time ago, I think, maybe 11 or 12 years ago, maybe longer. Um, but it still remains a firm favourite among uh, comics aficionados. But uh, Nick is a, a writer, editor, illustrator, all sorts, senator. That's mm. not a word, but it sounded kind of cool. Mm. Uh, and a massive Jerry Anderson fan. He's been associated with uh, the Eagle Moss material uh, and the development of those eagles and beyond. And uh, it was just a great fun to chat to. So here, without further ado, is Nick Abadzis, part one. Hello, I'm Nick Abadzis, uh, and I am what is popularly known these days as a graphic novelist. I think of myself as a cartoonist or, or comic writer and artist. And... Um, 
I worked in comics for about oh over 30 years now, which dates me. Started off on a kind of music and comics magazine called Daylight Deadline, uh, famous for a character called Hugo Tate. I've done lots of children's books and uh, comics. I've written Doctor Who comics. And probably my most well-known publication is Leica, which was a graphic novel that was published in 2007 and is still in print and is about the Russian Cosmo dog who went up in Sputnik 2 and uh, and uh, was Earth's first space traveller. And I'm actually working on a VR animation uh, based on that graphic novel at the moment with um, Asif Kapadia, who's known for his Oscar-winning documentary, Amy, about Amy Winehouse. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, that sort of praises everything that I've been doing for, over the COVID times. That is that is quite a lot of stuff, Nick. And funnily enough, did you know that Dad was fascinated by Like of the Dog's space journey, so much so that his 1999 series, Lavender Castle, had a character in it named Lyca? I did not know that, no. Oh. Um, I mean, you kind of, I mean, you come across a lot of characters um, called Lyca, but you just sort of assume it's so far into, um, you know, uh, general culture that it, that that name gets used and reused but i didn't know about his own fascination that that's delightful actually <laughs> i'm quite thrilled by that um, right. i would have if, if i'd have known i'd have sent him a copy of the book um and i'm yeah i missed him i'm sad to, to say well you're connected by this thread of fascination with space dogs so uh, <laughs> there you go there's at least something and as we're going to discover there's lots more fascination too can i also ask nick your surname is so cool. I now want to write it into something. Is what, what's? It, this is not relevant to the podcast, but I'm still interested. What's the What's the origin? It is Greek. Um, okay, I, I'm half Greek. My, my dad was an Alexandrian Greek, born in Egypt um, at the time when that city was a sort of very cosmopolitan place, and he originally comes from a a place called Smyrna, which is now part of Turkey, I think, and. Uh, back in those days when he was born in the 30s, it was, um, or was it the 20s he was born? Uh, 29 he was born. Um, so he on, yeah. So he was he was ethnically Greek. And when NASA decided that um, Egypt should be for Egyptians, and he, he wanted kind of all the foreigners out. My dad was at university in Belgium because the lingua franca, the, you know, the way everybody communicated in in. Alexandria was French, mm. so he spoke extremely good French. And um, he was in Belgium at uni, and then he discovered he couldn't go home. And he was good at all the Latin language, languages, but he didn't have English. So he decided he was going to relocate to London and learn it. And that's where he met my mum, who's from South London. <laughs> so I'm, I'm half South London, half Greek, yeah. Amazing. Well, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to add... A bad this to the to my like list of names to use at some point <laughs> i would be honored i would be very honored <laughs> all right oh, done. Dear. that's it's on record now i've got free use of a so uh nick we we've been brought together through uh serendipity uh eagles and ufo and all sorts of stuff and you dropped me an email because we're doing this ufo comic anthology later in the year which is going to be yeah. lovely and you've also been working on the Eagle, Eagle Moss Eagles, and we're going to come to that later and mm -hmm. how that has happened. So clearly Space 1999 and probably UFO are going to feature in your Anderson childhood memories. Very but much. if we can tap into the, the very earliest memories you have of anything Anderson, what show or shows would those be? I think it would be Thunderbirds and Stingray for me. Of course. I mean, and probably a bit of Captain Scarlet and Joe Ninety as well. But I'm, I'm a child of the early seventies and brought up in London, so it's sort of dependent on what was broadcast, of course, in, in you know in that that uh, region at that time. Uh, but Thunderbirds was always being repeated. I didn't know that, of course, when I was a little kid. It was just on, and you were like, oh, cool, Thunderbirds. And um, my older brother had a Thunderbird too. Uh, one of the original proper green coloured ones, a dinky yeah. toy. And he'd smashed off the wing. And so this was because he, he was kind of like that. And um, I always really wanted my own Thunderbird too. 
and eventually I think my mother caved and bought me one of the, the dinky toys ones and it was it was the metallic blue version <laughs> and I was like you're on colour which of course was all part of the charm of uh uh, of dinky toys back then. Yeah. Um, and I think the kind of toy experience and the merchandising experience was inextricably caught up in the way you watch the TV shows because you'd sit there with your little Thunderbird 2. Oh, and I also had a little, I also had a little green one from out of a cereal carton as well. Was it from I, Sugar Smacks or something I think like it was that. Sugar Smacks, yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I had this little one, and I've never forgotten this. This was a traumatic episode for me. I was so into Thunderbirds, and I was always doing the Thunderbird 2 takeoff sequence, and I'd imitate it while I was watching the show on TV and, you know, guide my, my dinky Thunderbird 2 into, um, into flight. But I took this little kind of Sugar Smacks Thunderbird 2 to school one day, which was fatal. What an error. And um, and I loved this little thing, this little plastic freebie from Sugar Smacks. Yeah. And I was waiting in the school lunch queue, and one of the dinner ladies came along, and she was a right authoritarian old so-and-so with the big crossed arms and the sort of, you know, yeah. what's that? Give that to me. And she took it off me, and I never saw it again. No. And I was heartbroken. And um, and that uh, it kind of traumatised me. It was a, it was a good lesson because I never brought any of my toys into school mm. again. But I still think about that that little green freebie. Yeah. And um, I can see the, the the anger in there and the, the upset, the hurt. Do you, do you <laughs> remember what her name was? Because I'm thinking she could be a villain in something. Mrs. Haynes. Oh, Mrs. there you go. That's that's a pretty that's a pretty evil name, I'd say. <laughs> she was. Um, she was a she was a kind of a bit a bit of an old battle axe as we used to call them. Yeah. But yeah, the the it was the and Stingray was a big deal as well because I loved the kind of like the drum beat as the kind of uh, oh, yeah, the music tune came in the Barry Gray, you know, efforts. I mean, they were that was I think those are my earliest memories to do mm. with, them. and and I I knew that name, you know, everything was always. Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, and and those names came up more than others. Yeah, and then kind of you started to spot them, and you're like, okay, he does this other puppet show as well. He does Captain Scarlet and Joe Ninety, and um, and that's a cool car as well. I want one of those. <laughs> and then as you got older, you started to kind of see certain names like Derek Meddings and Bob Bell. Yeah. He's, Tony Barwick, these names would start to kind of, as you got a little bit older, they, they, you sort of built up a, a tapestry, a sense of these people making these things behind the scenes. And I, I became a, a, a devourer of any information I could find, you know, whether it was old TV 21s that you'd find at a, a school jumble sale or something, a school fake. <laughs> I remember getting a huge pile of those and thinking, ah, this, this, I can't believe this. This is. It's like a whole comic, and they've got the Daleks on the back, you know. And um, and I read Looking, which of course had a Space nineteen ninety nine comic strip. But I'm getting ahead of myself there. Uh, well, you were you clearly it was like it was uh, what they now call, I suppose, transmedia, right? You you know you were. I was I was listening to an interview yesterday with Keith Shackleton, who was one of the kind of pioneers of the of the the toy side, the merchandising yeah. center twenty one, and they really like. They preempted what's now called play pattern and all the licensing and stuff. And that, you know, they set up a, an entire industry and you were right in the midst of that. You were watching it on the <laughs> telly, you were playing with the toys and you were going for the comics. I mean, what, did you get the mini albums as well or is that one step too far? Um, I, the only mini album I had was actually a Doctor Who one. But <gasps> it had a Century 21 label and it was yeah. um, William Hartnell it was um, the final episode of The Chase I think that had been yeah. truncated and put onto one of those mini mini albums um, and I didn't I, I've, I've got a lot of replicas that I got from Fanderson a lot later and various other bits and pieces but I wasn't aware of those no if I had been I would have eaten them up I'm sure uh, three out of four ain't bad though Nick you were doing all the rest of them so. <laughs> In, in context, the other telly that was on at, at the time, I'm guessing you were also exposed to stuff like maybe Doctor Who and Star Trek yeah. and that kind of thing. How did they rate and compare against the Anderson stuff? And you can be completely honest. Well, I, I 
I love Doctor Who. I'm a and Star Trek, um, the original Star Trek. I'm a. I mean, it was all color mm. surrounding, and I wasn't quite sure. And you know, we, we, I could still remember. I think I was just old enough to see the last moon landing in 1972. I remember the astronauts splashing down and being caught by, you know, the capsule being picked up by a Sea King helicopter, which you could also get as a dinky toy. So that was cool, <laughs> you know, a little capsule. And I, 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 you know, I badgered my, my parents for these things. I had them. And I think in my mother's case, it was because she understood that it was somehow fueling my imagination because I used to draw a lot and I used to write my own stories once I could write. And I think that, I think um, Doctor Who, who was John Pertwee in, in those days, uh, that really, I can really, I can really recall the kind of final, I can recall John Pertwee turning into Tom Baker, yep. Tom Baker making a huge impact. And all of that stuff was very, very important to me, definitely. And Star Trek, Mr. Spock, all those kinds of characters, lots of other things, lots of animated stuff too, I'm sure. And mm. um, whatever else was on the Tomorrow People, yeah, um, the changes, all those kind of, you know, BBC and ITV, very, very particular kind of British science fiction, yeah. which I miss yeah. you know, living over here. Um, and um, it, I, it all sort of got absorbed, I think, into my child self and, and, uh, and I was reading a lot of comics, and I think my mother especially, my, I think it was my dad's best hope for a scientist. So he encouraged anything science fiction, and he sort of thought that this would, this would lead into a scientific career and really kind of pressured me to do that when I was a bit older. Um, the, and, little did he know he was feeding the comic beast instead. Uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the pull of the arts was just too strong, yeah. particularly, particularly comics, but... And I think getting that big pile of old TV 21s was a, was a major moment for me because it something clicked in my head that it wasn't just a TV experience that you had to wait for because in those days everything was broadcast, no VHS, no recording facility, unless you got your own kind of little cassette recording um, of the soundtrack, which I used to do. Yeah. Did a hell of a lot when I was a bit older with Space 1999, which is why I know some of those soundtracks so well. So I listened to them ad nauseum, you know. But it's, uh, I became aware that, you know, there are all these kind of fantastic comics. And, and I was like, hey, the guy who draws Fireball XL5 is the same guy that draws Space 1999 in Looking Now, Mike Noble. And the guy, that's John M. Burns. It's the same. It gave you this sense of continuity yeah throughout all the you know and this shared universe as well which i think your dad you know jerry anson and all those guys Anil fennel at um tv 21 were doing way before you know i mean well or in tandem with at the same time as marvel marvel had just yeah. begun doing it and dc were doing it a bit but but tv 21 really went hell for leather on it yeah. really really did it You've got yeah, Fireball XL five strip with uh, Wasp from Stingray and Lady Penelope all in the same story. So yeah, yeah, they were they were definitely ahead of the ahead of the game with that in so many respects. Did you find the Anderson stuff more kind of toy worthy for some reason than the other shows? I found myself hugely impressed by the special effects. <laughs> of course, I mean yeah, I was, but I mean it's. I think the beauty of it and the kind of thing that I admire as an adult was that I took all the characters as I did not see them as puppets. Absolutely not. I just kind of, they, they were who they were. And I, and until I kind of understood that what actors were and, um, <laughs> you know, people actually kind of read lines that were written down. Yeah. I just, it, it was all of a piece to me. Um, you know, Lady Penelope and Parker and Scott Tracy and Virgil Tracy and Troy Tempest, they were all, they were real, mm. they were real to me. And I kind of, so I, I paid less attention to that than I did to the kind of, you know, the, the Meddings-esque model sequences with all the kind of cool hardware. Yeah. And to, to directly answer your question, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the completeness of what you were watching was was really evident even to me as a little kid 
I was kind of like, you know, what Thunderbirds looks so cool. Why does it look so cool? And the, the special effects on Doctor Who are so naff. <laughs> <laughs> understanding nothing of the production completely different production processes but and uh star trek also kind of i loved the enterprise and the design of the enterprise but that blue screen method i was like why don't they just do what jerry anderson knows what he's doing man he really don't know he could you know, and the explosions it's all so realistic it yeah. All, so yeah it was definitely very toy worthy mm -hmm. and, and that certainly initiated my kind of love of science fiction design yeah and stuff that i thought was cool and detailed models and miniatures and you know, the reality the, the realism of those those special effect shots that, that mr meddings and all of his huge team precipitated yeah that clever bunch so as as you were you, you, it sounds like you were in the kind of golden age for anderson stuff because you were awash with the supermarination stuff and then yeah. as you were growing up, Century 21 was growing up with you, really, into Group 3. So were you, yeah. there, you were then being fed with, I guess, UFO and then Space 1999. So did it, did it feel that was tracking your growing up? I'm just old enough, I think, to kind of remember. UFO was very mysterious to me because mm. it seemed very adult. And yes. Very, kind of quite terrifying compared mm. to the puppet shows. Um, and... I thought they were. It was incredibly cool, and also I should say that the the you know the moon base space trackers they did something that I didn't understand what that was yet, <laughs> and it was kind of like, wow, they're really beautiful. I don't <laughs> understand why why I think they're so beautiful. I'm not. I'm a boy. I'm not supposed to like girls, you know. That prepubescent something was stirring there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, couldn't figure that out. And Ed Straker, Ed Bishop, was incredibly cool. Yeah. He was just the coolest man on TV. And I, I loved it. And I, of course, and I got my, my, U my dinky UFO interceptor, which I've still got, along with my dinky UFO eagle. I, but I didn't, really, I didn't really understand it. Yeah. I, I watched it and... Um, or when I could, when it wasn't on too late, because I, I remember being asking, I remember fight, getting a TV Times and saying to my mum, look, they're showing UFO tonight. It's at 11.30. Can I watch it? Can I start? And she was like, absolutely not. No, you know. And for years, those kind of, th th I knew there were all these unwatched episodes of Unseen for me, episodes yeah. of UFO. So it had a sort of cachet about it, an air of mystery, yeah. which I was really attracted to. And, you know, much, much later when I could afford to buy the VHS tapes when they first started coming out, I was like, wow, I haven't seen any of these. And um, that was a big, that was a big thrill, really. Yeah. And, and, and how did it feel compared to your sort of brief childhood sort of dalliance with it, going back to it as an adult? Was it, was it suddenly that the veil was drawn back and it was demystified and lost its magic or did it still have the kind of sinister vibe, but you could now appreciate it? it became a kind of far more strange and adult experience watching it again. I mean, I actually rewatched it um, last year again during COVID when mm. I was just watched it all on Blu-ray, which was, and I, and I, I think it just gets better with age. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's really a kind of, there's some incredible stuff in there, especially those David Tomlin directed episodes, you know, and, um, when it kind of became a little bit more experimental with its own format towards the end of yeah. the, you know, and, and, and the sort of the, the Pinewood film see, uh, episodes rather than the, the, the Borenwood ones. Yeah. And it's, it's very experimental, very strange and quite eerie in places. Mm. And, the, and the premise is, is frightening. It's really scary. And they, um, and it, you kind of realize as it's going along, it's not actually about the aliens it's about the people, the, the earth people, getting through their jobs and being professional and protecting the earth under incredible stress. Yeah. And it's a really brilliant portrait of one guy particularly, which is, you know, Ed Bishop as Ed Straker. Yeah. And him slowly, and him slowly developing from this armchair-bound dude who's just pushing paper to becoming this kind of far more involved character. Yeah. It's great, yeah. He he's a an amazingly layered mm. character by the end of that 
single season. Yeah. So I think that's probably what I what I realised um, when I kind of came to saw it, see it again. And, uh, yeah, it definitely wasn't a, a kid's show. No. But I know that Dad Dad never wanted to pigeonhole anything demographic-wise. He did, ne- never went out to do a show and say, right, this is for six to eight-year-olds or this is for seven to... It was a different era, obviously, a different time, and that's kind of almost forced upon you now. Yeah. But it was clearly a graduation from puppets to to the live action stuff thank you nick part two next week as you might imagine i think Mm -hmm. i mentioned it there but fantastic face furniture on nick yes amazing (laughs) top-notch facial facial hair i was most impressed Uh, and his kind of office studio man cave was very very cool so i'm sorry you couldn't see that um if you would like to know more about nick then can i recommend you go to nickabadzis.com which is his official site and if you're wondering how to spell a badzis it's a b a d z i s or for our americans a b a d z i s Oh yeah, uh, yeah so good. nickabadzis.com uh, and you can find him at nickabadzis on Twitter mm-hmm. so Great. there you go what a nice man uh, more next week crikey uh, brilliant <laughs> now uh, over on Twitter people have been tweeting all about us tweeting on Twitter that sounds unbelievable <laughs> would you believe it uh, now I say that that John Vince actually tweeted the Radio Times he's incandescent with rage oh, really? disgraceful says John that in your 21 best podcasts to listen to now in your opinion in your latest issue that you haven't included excellent Price of Football podcast and the superb Jerry Anderson podcast oh, shame you, on you, you. yes, yes. Yeah, we'll, come we'll, on we're most Times. disappointed I have written a strongly worded letter to my MP about the matter I mean, to be fair, you do get pretty good coverage in Radio Times. <laughs> to be fair, yeah, no, lovely Morgan Jeffrey yeah. there is brilliant That's to right. us. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, uh, yeah, and, and others too. I, I shouldn't just say it's not all down to Morgan. Yeah. There's Mark Braxton That's and right. others. So thank you, Radio Times, for being so kind to us. Yeah, uh, Except uh, lost in transition. Well, quite. Uh, tweeted, after hearing uh, Jules de Young today on the Jerry Anderson podcast, I'm going to give her a follow. Thanks for the recommendation. And also, he tweeted to Chris Dale after his uh, randomizer review of the day after tomorrow. Thank you, thank you, thank you for feeling the love for this oft-forgotten Jerry Anderson gem. In reply to your questions on the podcast, I was 11 when I first saw it, and I would definitely have loved to have seen it developed into a series. Hmm there yeah uh, over on youtube people have been commenting on uh, previous podcasts in this case pod 178 ian Dealey uh, continues the love for the day after tomorrow by saying what a nice treat to have it on the randomizer i watched it once on the anderson tv website a few times and i have to say it's rather good uh, gmlpc says i really enjoyed that the convention section in this podcast was very good uh, especially how nick tate got the job including his array of accents but even better was the randomizer on into infinity an easily overlooked production lenny fair posted i loved the day after tomorrow and the fact that hard science was thrown at the teenage me i understood much of it and wanted to know more my my good days oh when will there be a dvd of into infinity mm. there is one it's called, yes. it's called the lost worlds of jerry anderson it's available yes. in uh, the uk in europe uh, in north america and also in australia new zealand so, um, so there you go most places <laughs> Yeah, there you are, Lenny. But that's took you by surprise. Yeah, go grab uh, it. Just search for the Lost Worlds of Jerry Anderson, and you'll be you'll be all set. Yeah, uh, all for now. But in the meantime, you can uh, tweet us and hashtag us Jerry Anderson Podcast and tag me Richard and James him over there. I'm Jamie Anderson and uh, Chris. Oh, he's come. Oh, look, he's got uh, all those uh, unopened uh, on card uh, Marvel characters there. Oh, he's oh, very pleased with those. Isn't Hang he? on, he's brought somebody else's oh. box back. Oh God, that's someone's stock, isn't it? Oh dear. Anyway, that's uh, at Chris Dalek. Uh, yeah, are we at Chris, your tweets next time. If, if at Chris Dalek has, has stolen your uh, cult <laughs> items from MCM Birmingham, then we do apologise. Please get in touch, oh, and we'll inform the authorities on your behalf. Um, but don't do it too soon because he's got to do the randomizer. Uh, is there anything oh, yes. you'd like to talk about before the randomizer, Richard James, or should we just let Chris get on no. with it? Yeah, let's let him get on with it. Okay, fine. Uh, well, Chris has a machine called the Randomizer, which has a big red button. And when he hits that button, a random Jerry Anderson episode from a random Jerry Anderson series is chosen. Chris sits down in front of it and says some random but highly entertaining things. And he's about to do that now. <gasps> whoa. 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 Oh. Wow. Whoa. Oh. Oh. This is fun. Oh. Bit dizzy, though. Oh. 
Well, I must say, the Colonel's chair is every bit as comfy as it looks. Uh, Lieutenant, he's, uh, he's not going to notice that I've been sitting in it while he's away, is he? He usually does. Oh, bother. Don't worry, I'm saying nothing. Well, that's very kind of you, Lieutenant. Uh, is there a price for your silence? I won't be able to fool the Colonel for long. What about, uh... Oh, I suppose you mean a go on the randomizer. I'm ready to go, sir. Well then, Lieutenant, if you'd care to do the honours. S.I.G. That's it. Uh, are you feeling all right, Lieutenant? It's just that I can't bear this waiting. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Just uh, try to breathe normally. Uh, that's it. And perhaps you could tell us what we're watching today. Looks like false alarm, sir. Ah, excellent. Well then, here's Supercar. Do I get a coconut? As a matter of fact, I've brought you a whole bag. Great. Supercar! <laughs> So, welcome back to Supercar on the Randomizer with False Alarm. And uh, I have to apologize right up front and say... Oh, I love this opening. Um, that's not the apology. Oh yeah, even though in HD, the, the little figure of Mike at the controls of Supercar in this film that Master Spy and Zarin are watching is a bit well, Zarin, phony. What do you think of that? Oh, I liked it, Master Spy, very much. But I prefer Western. Oh, I, I just adore this this opening, this very sort of film noirish scene of um, Master Spy and Zarin plotting their their stealing of supercar. There's um, it's very it's very film noirish. Lots of shadows. And in a few hours, my friend. And this is of course in uh, original broadcast order. The first time we meet Master Spy and Zarin. Ourselves. This was episode two on first broadcast in. Uh, ITC order, this is episode four, uh, so they would have already been introduced in Talisman of Sargon at that point. Our activities without hindrance, we have no alternative but to, well, uh, steal your choice of And there's, it's strange, there's no real sort of introduction to them. We're just presented with them in... We shall acquire... In this sort of continuing state that they are apparently in of having gone up against the supercar team before, and now we've got to do something to, uh to take care of it. <laughs> Simple, my friend. Always these people are ready to answer a call for help. Mm. So we will call and they will answer. And yeah, for the second episode in broadcast order, it is. it doesn't quite feel right that Master Spy is taking advantage of this already established trope that the supercar team will rescue anybody. Ready? Or even that the supercar team have been operating long, uh, long enough to have made such mortal enemies as Master Spy and Zarin. Will come, but not here. We shall receive them uh, somewhere inaccessible. Somewhere, uh, yes, somewhere high up in the mountain. Oh, he does look very sinister. I think that's one of the few scenes where Master Spy really feels like a genuine, credible threat because he does look so intimidating and he is lit so well. No, sir, not a thing. Everything's just great. Uh, talking of things that are going well. Best remote, Mike. Jimmy, there's Jimmy. Uh, so, yes, I said I needed to apologize and I do because. Uh, I am recording this on a slightly different microphone to the one that I would normally use because I am currently going through technological problems and um, rather than, uh, you know, delay the randomizer, the, ra the work of the randomizer must continue no matter what, uh, I'm using a, a different microphone to normal. So if this sounds different, I apologize. Steadying it at a level where outside... Hopefully we'll be all right. ...to a minimum. Anyway. Instant and positive response. Well, we've docked the beaker to thank for sorting that one out. We have installed a remote control unit for supercar. Mike Weller answers the telephone. Which amounts to... Good thing the dark beaker's around. ...a few buttons and Hello? one great big lever. Who is that calling? Professor Popkins, this is Sergeant Petrie, Nevada State Police. Oh, and George Massell's doing a nice job here, um... Oh, and we think ...doing the two characters talking to each other. But why do you think? Yes, I know you have rough details of my work for security reasons only, but the state police cannot possibly reach the spot in time. Strange as well that Master Spy is uh, very on the ball compared to the local police. He knows that the supercar team have been travelling all over the world helping people. The local police at this point don't seem to uh, to have twigged that. 
It's something I've noticed actually watching the series uh, on Blu-ray, because we now have Supercar on Blu-ray, and I've just finished watching the whole series. And uh, it is noticeable that throughout the first series, it is very, the, the supercar project is very secret, and then in the second series, suddenly it's the world famous supercar team. Um, much like the difference between Thunderbirds, the TV show, and Thunderbirds 6, where suddenly everybody knows about International Rescue and who the Tracys are. Dead, 180 miles northeast of here. I figure that's in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Anyway, we're going out to, uh, to deal with this distress call. And that's why the police called us. That's right. They know we've rescued people before. Me and Bill, for a start. Well, what are we waiting? Does Mitch not count? I'm on for dark already. Well, I'll, I'll think I'll come too. Jimmy seems to be um, squatting in this scene. I don't think he's sitting on a chair. Uh, when I was younger. Oh. Ready, Mike? Ready it is. Charging both, then. So it's Mike and Beaker off to the rescue. Ready for takeoff. Okay, Dr. Beaker? Yeah, ready, pilot. Roof doors open. Well, that's a nice shot from above looking down on uh, Mike and Beaker in supercar with their medical supplies in the back. And they flopped the um, the traditional shot of the uh, roof doors opening there. I don't remember that happening too often. Calling Consul. Hello, Professor. Everything's fine up here, except it's getting dark. Have you marked the position of the distress call on your plane? Roger, position marked. And oddly enough, this is actually, I think, the fourth time I've seen this episode this year because... Network played it on their uh, Jerry Anderson night in back in April. I then reviewed it for possible clips for the uh, Supercar Blu-ray trailer. I then watched it again when I was when the Supercar Blu-rays came out. So this is my fourth time watching this episode this year. Uh, oddly enough, I don't remember too much about it. Having said all that, this is a nice pan across a the desert terrain, which probably wasn't a very big set, but nice moody atmospheric music to help sell it there. And of course this is the Master Spy theme, so of course we know who's lurking down there. Pretty rough down there, Dr. Baker. What you Again, I, I love that uh, in certain episodes, Master Spy and Zarin have a truck until it gets blown up, and sometimes they just appear, and this I think is one of the episodes where they just appear, somehow they get out to the desert. Uh, in fact, it's referenced later on. They have no, they have no transport of their own to get home again. Congratulations. How did they get out here? You're the map reading. They have come to the exact spot. Uh, oh, and it's lit very. I was say, I was going to say lit very dark there, but I don't think that's lit at all. That shot of a uh, supercar landing. Well, she's down. More luck than skill, I guess. But I suppose that's slightly more realistic than, uh, safely and we'll call you, in 15 you know, when it's night, it's night. It is total darkness. It's uh, a bit more realistic than lighting it as if it was dark. Now, hold on, Jimmy. They've got to get organized first. Ah, there he is, trying to make a campfire. Curious. Most curious. Theoretically, it should work. Simple conversion of kinetic energy into heat at the rate of 4.2 joules per carole. More science. Do it. Even in the Boy Scouts. You want a lighter? No, thank you. I have some matches. But, um, mm, it's not quite the same thing, is it? Oh. <laughs> oh. Meanwhile, Master Spy and Zarin are still draped over these rocks. They are wise. No, friend. Because the Master Spy puppet is so large, he can't quite... He can't quite lean over something and spy on someone, you know, just his head over the top. He has to lean his whole body over, which makes him quite an obvious target, but no one ever seems to spot him. I remember there's another episode, I think it's uh, Keep It Cool, where he, he almost, because he's so big, the puppeteer almost has to fly him into the shot and land his torso on a rock. Aww. Have Master Spy. Be close at hand. Maybe, but unless your sixth sense can see in the dark, Doc, we'll have to leave it till morning. Need a mountain goat to climb this by moonlight. Uh, true. We did not expect the terrain to be so difficult. Okay, you pour the coffee and I'll call up the prof. They ought to be calling any minute, Professor, don't you reckon? They should do, Jimmy. We'll hear them. Uh, where is Mitch, by the way? Oh, he went out a while back. He seems to like midnight walks outdoors. No, he just likes being away from you. Calling console. That's something as well that I've discovered watching uh, Supercar. 
that you're marathoning the whole series for the first time in probably at least five years uh, on Blu-ray, because it's on Blu-ray and it looks very nice, uh, is, oh my goodness, I hate Jimmy. I hate Jimmy so much. He is what what Jamie and, and many others mistakenly believe Joe was like in, in Joe 90. He's just always telling people, not only telling people what to do, he's telling people to do what they're already doing or reminding them of things that they hadn't forgotten. He just, ugh, he irritates me so much. Good mug of coffee, Doc. It was pleasant. This is nice, though. Uh, most pleasant. Uh, I feel Mike and Beaker sharing a, a tent and... Instead of being in the tent with them, we're seeing their well, I'm right with you. their silhouettes yeah. against the the canopy, illuminated by candlelight. Now, a few minutes more, friends are in, and we will overcome them. Oh, he's he's building up to the overcoming moment. Well, Jimmy, I should think that's all until morning. <laughs> what have you been doing with him? You saw thorough debriefing. Comes in through the skylight. I've had enough of you. You're cold out, though. I never understand why why Jimmy has a huge rifle on the wall in his room. Oh, yes. Mike knows how to take care of himself, and so does Dr. Beaker. I expect he can't wait to get a chance to use his first aid kit when they find those two men. Oh, uh, they've been tied up with their own bandages. <laughs> Too easy, was it not, friend Zarin? This is actually one of Master Spy's greatest successes. He is... It successfully overcome Mike and Beaker. <laughs> Doped with their ether from their own first aid box. <laughs> that is a that is physical overpowering, and he's managed to do it to both of them. Good, must very impressive. Very good. Mm. And now we take the car. No. <laughs> For once, you are right, friend Zarin. Yes. Now we take the car. <laughs> oh. So yeah, although Master Spy and Zarin don't really have an introductory episode as such, this this probably is the best one, the the, pre the best candidate I should say, because they do come off as a very credible threat. Whereas later they were far more sort of silly knockabout villains. I also love the image of Master Spy in the supercar cockpit, because again the puppet is just so big and bulky and unmaneuverable. But how to start the motors? Ah, this is it. Ooh. And of course you've got Zarin sat next to him. Oh. The puppet is trembling and his eyes are darting back and forth. Uh, every every noise. It's something I found a bit disappointing going into the second series. A lot of the characters got slight redesigns and I don't think many of them looked that good as good as they did in the first series. Zarin, in, Zarin was one of the the ones that um, definitely got a downgrade for the second series. What has happened, Master Spy? He looked a bit more like Marty Feldman in the second series, whereas here he looks, well, he looks like Zarin. Idiot. What do you think? Let me out! Stay where you are. Nothing has happened yet. I know. That is why I wish to get out. Before it happened. Not, Not only is this a great way to establish our two main villains for the series, it's also a great establishing of their their relationship. I don't know why Zarin and Master Spy stay together. Oh, I feel yes. You know, professionally. It's we are still on the ground. I still feel yes. I don't see what Master Spy gets from keeping Zarin around, and surely Zarin would be far happier not having to deal with uh, with this sort of thing all the time. Oh, what I think? No! <laughs> oh, gosh. Zarin just slumped forward like he'd fainted or he was going to be sick. Oh, poor guy. But here we go. Master Spy has got it off the ground. I'm back at the uh, lab. Everyone is asleep. All the human characters are asleep anyway. I'm, I'm generously including Jimmy in that uh, that statement. Well, friend Zarin, do you not think I make a fine pilot? Very good, Master Spy. Very good indeed. No. I'm not sure what Master Spy's long-term plan here is. Is he planning to sell the car on to someone else to uh, to profit from the tech, or is it just owning the thing is enough of a... Oh, wobbly. 
is enough of a, a triumph in itself. Master Spy, if you tell me once more to be careful. This is also a nice, uh, a nice use of the fact that um, some shots of supercar flying look a bit wobbly, and here the fact that Master Spy doesn't really know what he's doing, and someone else is about to take the controls of the machine, it, it kind of plays into that uh, that fact rather well. Say something, friend Zarin. Because back at the workshop. <laughs> Our hairy boy has taken control by remote. And uh, 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 despite the fact that I said... Um, oh my goodness, he's working the remote with his foot. Yeah, despite the fact that I said um, in re-watching the series, I, I've come to hate Jimmy more than I ever have before, it's given me a new appreciation for Mitch, actually. Uh, and I always liked Mitch anyway. But um, in the second series, unfortunately, he is generally the cause of most of the problems. But in the first series, the Woodhouses use him very cleverly. I mean, there are some episodes where he is almost the most the most useful person on the team and Dragon of Ho Meng which is a, 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 a less than stellar episode he's almost like some kind of detective he finds all the clues he is insanely useful through most of the first season there's a couple of times where he's a, a bit of a liability but this is uh, this is a rather nice way to use him he's heard Master Spy talking over the radio and he's uh, now just playing with a remote control lever Professor Professor no. Go away, Jimmy. What is it, Jimmy? Not another nightmare? I heard voices coming from the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I love Mitch when he's just in full screaming mode. It's actually, uh, I've, um, again, watching the series on Blu-ray, it sort of reinforced my uh, long-held notion that Mitch is not actually a monkey. Mitch is a little man with severe rage issues who went to a therapist and at some point during his therapy was encouraged to put on a monkey costume. He then went insane and uh, just ran out into the world pretending to be a monkey for the rest of his life. I heard that boy's voice. It's much funnier, to me at least, to... Uh, to go through the series with that, that idea of his character in mind. Because he doesn't look much like a monkey. Anyway. Let them put us safely down on the ground again. Silence. Our distress call fakers are now in distress themselves. Why don't they answer? I don't know, Jimmy. There is something strange going on. Hmm. Mike would know what to do if the transmitter failed. Console to pilot. Do you read me? Switch to emergency call at once. We do not read you here. <laughs> oh, and Mitch had stopped playing with the remote control lever and then just suddenly we get an extreme close-up on him looking a bit sneaky and then he just nudges it to the left slightly. Professor, it's not Mike. I thought it wasn't his voice. It's Master Spy. <gasps> Thank goodness we have you here to identify that, Jimmy. For you to identify someone that you've never actually met in this broadcast order before? So the machine has beaten us. Then where are Mike and Dr. Beaker? That I will not tell you, unless you put us down at once, safely. I shall do no such thing. And I like Popkiss answering back to him there. Popkiss is, he's a very smiley looking character. He's a very happy man generally, despite the fact that he spends most of his time dealing with Jimmy's inane questions. Yes, Mitch. So it's nice. There's a bit of uh, a bit of steel there at times. He's turned control of supercar back over to Mitch. Whoa. You'd be interested to know, Master Spy, that Mitch is a monkey. But reasonably skilled, nevertheless. <laughs> Ooh, that's quite sinister. Yeah, I, I, again, going back to orders and introductions of Master Spy and Zarin, I have a feeling that Mitch was there for Talisman of Sargon. Um, or maybe he wasn't locked in the tomb. But it is, it is difficult to sort of pin down a precise chronology of Supercar Team's relationship with Master Spy and Zarin, because each episode order seems to contradict the other. As though an, an army, a positive army of pachyderms were trampling across the top of it. Well, they sure fooled us that time. Doped us with our own ether. Mm, to be sure. To be sure. Is this the first time we've encountered them, or have there been other encounters? I 
I can't quite keep it straight. Yourself in future. Ooh. Okay, Dr. Big. That's a diss. You win. The point seems to me to be, um, what are we to do now in the circumstances? Well, there's not much we can do except get set for a nice long walk. All right, Master Spy, just sit back and relax. We will fly you safely back from where you came. Uh, speaking philosophically, I suppose this will teach us in the future to um, uh, look more carefully uh, before we leap. Okay, Doc, let's go. Around here it pays to get your walking done early before the sun gets too high. Uh, Neither of them seem particularly bothered that supercar has been stolen. Distinct impression. I, I heard something. I believe, I believe, mind you, that it's Supercar. Hey. Returning. You're right, Dr. Beaker. There she is. Oh. This is the early days of the model before they'd painted the word Supercar on the bottom. Right. We can leave them quite safely to Mike and Dr. Beaker, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Good old Mitch. And now... What are you going to do with us, Mr. Mercury? Well, now, uh, I'm sure sorry we can't give you a lift, but we've got all this baggage. They, um, they look a little pale. Perhaps if they were to take the, uh, 15-mile walk that was to have been our lot. Ooh. 15 miles by my feet. Ah, first your stomach. Then your feet. Be silent, worm. Again, that goes back to the question of how they got out here in the first place. They clearly don't have a, a way back at the end. There's no truck concealed somewhere to get them home. How did they get out here in the first place? Well, no matter, because Mike and Beaker are just going to abandon them. I do like the, uh... Well, reckon Mitch has come to the rescue again. <laughs> Shut up. I do like the very tame nature of the rivalry between uh, Supercar and, and Master Spy. It's all just sort of... Well, tired after their walk. It's very casual. Think of it, Master Spy could lose a little weight. Ooh. Anyway, I would not say that our journey had been um, entirely without profit. Why, right, Doctor, what have you found? Ooh. Well, it, it, it's rather curious, in a way, seeing that uh, we were supposed to be rescuing the two members of a geological expedition. Uh, while you were packing up the tent, Mike, I found uh, uh, this. What is it, Dr. Beaker? Is it gold? A uh, gold? Oh, no, 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 Jimmy. There wouldn't be any gold where we landed. Uh, there's too much limestone about for that. No, there are some fossils of... Um, uh, uh, considerable interest embedded in this piece of rock. Uh, possibly the uh, trilobites of the late Cambrian period. But Ooh. I would have to examine them. This is a long way to go for a pointless bit of science. The analytic mind seems to be hard at work again. Again, I, I normally credit the Woodhouses for science inclusion, but... Uh, okay, Mike. Here she goes. That was a bit much. This is a nice ending, though. Popkiss just presses a, a switch saying, Fade video. It, I like that the uh, some of the early episodes of Supercar do have a sort of meta, almost, way of ending. A bit uh, fourth wall breaking. Anyway, that was... False alarm, and uh, I, yeah, I think that is probably the best candidate for an introduction to Master Spy and Zarin, and uh, as such, it it works very well. We establish both of them very clearly as an episode in its own right. It's a nice little, uh, you know, little diversion, as many uh, supercar episodes tend to be, especially in the early days. Just sort of seeing, seeing it all come together, and when we don't have the the, the the scale of, of production to do to do huge epic action adventure stuff we can do smaller and uh, occasionally slightly sillier stuff and that's a, a very nice small little early story from supercar very enjoyable too supercar, supercar. <laughs> See, I was just going to say Supercar. it, and, and you started singing yeah, how it. How could you just say it? You can't just say it. Wait, that's a bit like Stingray, isn't it? Stingray, Stingray. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, you're it's right. really hard not to sing these things. Yeah. Uh, imagine if Thunderbirds had lyrics well that weren't oh. that awful um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Barry Gray song that nearly made it. Uh, fun fact on that elsewhere on YouTube, if you want to go and find that. Yes, uh, but yes somewhere. Yes. Thank you, Chris. And you may have noticed in the uh, teaser trailer for 
Hmm. Jerry Anderson presents You've Never Seen These uh, on Network's hmm. watch platform on the 25th of November that uh, Supercar is featured there. Ooh. But what makes it so special? You'll Ooh. have to wait and find <gasps> out, but it won't be long. There should be news later this week, so uh, stand by for further updates. Great. Are you going to be watching it? You better be. Of course. Good. What else would I be doing? Well, actually, now you say it, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Do you know yeah. what we do? What we, we need to get together for a, um, a recording in person again, because I, although I have seen oh. you briefly a couple of times, yeah, once yeah, at Paddington yeah, yeah. Station and once in Slough. Yes. That's right. That's it, isn't it? For like two years. Yes, I know. Isn't that crazy? It's so so wow. strange. Yes, let's remedy that. Okay, fine. Uh, Christmas time done. Uh, yeah. Rich James, anything else from you before yep. we round off this marvellous 179th edition of the Jerry Anson Podcast? Uh, no, there's nothing more from me except to say that for our 180th edition, I'm going to be turning the spotlight back onto the real stars of the show, the Podstrongs. Ah, quite right too. I thought you were going to tell me yeah. you have got a dance player to interview, but... Uh... No, I know. We were so hoping that was going to happen, but... Oh, um, and 180 uh, I, I only sp- comes around once. Yes, I suppose it mainly didn't happen because neither of us took any steps at all to try and make it happen. I think that may have been a minor uh, yeah. cause in the That'll problem there. But next time, uh, maybe yes. for 1,180. Oh, right. We'll get 1,000 darts players for that one. Okay. Anyway, uh, that's the end of this week's podcast, Pod 179. Next week, you'll be surprised to know it is Pod 180. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll be back in your ears, be it be they clammy or dry. Um, be they. <laughs> be they. <laughs> and until then, uh, we wish you well, we bid you adieu, and say, Alfie de Zane Podsterons. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Let's go. Spectrum is green. You went all international. I know. Do you think we've got any listeners who would be happy to hear us do a Jerry Anson podcast in French or German or Spanish? How's your French? Uh, uh, I don't know what the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know. They might. might. Is there no sort of software that does that for you? Don't don't be lazy. Come on. We're very multicultural here at the uh, the Jerry Anson podcast. Let's do a French podcast one day. Okay, fine. I'm trying to think what will be a good number. Oh, sorry. Yes. Where where were Jerry Anderson shows most popular? What was the biggest market around the world, do you think? The biggest territory? Depends on the show. Depends on the show. Okay. Uh, Thunderbirds. Uh, UK. Really? Yeah, swiftly followed by Japan, I suspect. Okay. But then uh, Space yeah. 1999, I yeah. would think actually North America. Yeah. Followed by the UK, followed by Italy, maybe. Okay. So, yeah. And yeah. Uh, what, about the, what about the podcast? What, what's the most? Oh, well, I could actually tell you that. Oh, yeah, if, really? If you give me a minute, yeah. Yeah, go on. Yeah, just, you, just, 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 fill, just log in to Fill you. some time while I, while I look up right. the analytics. Well, I know we have listeners in China. We have yeah. listeners in Australia and New Zealand, I think. Uh, UK, of course, certainly America. Uh, we, I think, have maybe a listener or two in Germany. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going for all time here. All time. In yeah. all time. I mean, I'm, UK is going to be number one, of course. Gosh, yes. So we are mm-hmm. uh, yeah. number one United Kingdom with 63% of our downloads. Oh, right. Okay. Second position, United States with 17%. Oh, that's impressive. Third, Australia with 7.8%. Sorry, do you mean mean 17% of the whole of the USA are downloading the Jerry Anderson podcast? That's exactly what I don't (laughs) mean, yes, you're right. right. Uh, Yes, uh, 7.8% from Australia, Mm -hmm. 2.8% from Canada. Okay. 1.2% from New Zealand, although that's 5,000 people, I think. uh, Right, yes. At least uh, who who wow. have listened from from New Zealand, and that's about half yeah. the population of New Zealand, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's a bit weird, isn't Something it? Something like that, and then India shortly after. So, uh, oh, oh, oh sorry, I missed out the Netherlands there. Yeah, so we're we're yes. very uh, international. Very international. Um, yeah. Good. Do, do you want to know the place with the least listeners? 
Oh, uh, it'll probably be somewhere like um, Tuvalu. Uh, no, in uh, fifth from last place, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Lebanon. Right. Wow. Uh, fourth from last, it's uh, Liechtenstein. Okay. Third third from from last, what we've done to upset Liechtenstein, well, yes. Third from last, it's Syria. Okay. Second yeah, better from, things to do. Yeah, fair enough. A better, second from last is Uganda. Right. And in last place, uh, with just one listener uh, right. in the last... Uh, two years is Venezuela. <laughs> really? Yeah. So thanks, Venezuela, for your support. Did they just listen the once and decide it wasn't for them? It, it is actually just one single download yeah. from Venezuela, yeah. that one. So Okay. No, that's understandable. There you go. <laughs> we don't have much content for the Venezuelans, let's, let's be honest. No, Maybe we should is, remedy that. Yeah, you see, but see, France wasn't in the top the top 10 it's uh yeah it's 13th france so we need to right. remedy that too lots yeah. to do okay. lots of work to do come on we've got to up our yeah. game here yeah i'll crack over the brie and get a baguette out for next week okay fine and i'll i'll uh xenophobically get a ring of onions and a beret done yaw, yaw. good <laughs> oh we're gonna get uh we're gonna get deleted we and, are gonna be cancelled in france but yeah. uh yeah. uh Sorry. bonsoir uh au revoir yeah. à bientôt <clears throat> okay uh, bye bye Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.